okay? So, <clears throat> so this is uh, essentially your Bayes theorem. And of course, this is a very, um, uh, this very elementary form, right? Uh, generally, uh, when you deal with, uh, in the data context, um, you may generally come across something like this, right? For example, um, the uh, probability of some, so this may be a class, so your B may be a class, right? So I'll use class, uh, let's define um, Y equals to the class, okay? Which is uh, your plus one, minus one, yeah? In the binary case, okay? So given, so for a particular class, right? So suppose you know that um, the sample belongs to a certain class, what's the probability of observing the uh, data vector, right? So this is the data vector. Um, so your X is some data vector like, uh, all right, so the, the, this is your data vector, right? And of course this one, uh, you would, um, okay, uh, let me see, so. So this is uh, what you can actually, uh, this is what, what you can calculate. Okay, because uh, this one is you basically, you restrict yourself to a particular class, right? And then you, you, you try to find this probability. Um, now the, the term naive base here, the naive here comes from the fact that uh, we're going to treat this as, um, we're going to treat, uh, treat the joint probability as uh, uh, product of individual probabilities. Okay? So you, you know that in general, when you have some joint probability, right? Uh, you basically, in general, in general, it is not equal to the product unless, uh, unless uh, all the variables, right, are independent, okay? You basically cannot write this uh, unless you have this independence. And working with real data, you know that this is a long shot, right? Uh, assuming your variables to be independent, it's just not going to work. I mean, like in, in practice, it's not, not ever going to happen, okay? Because most of the time, the variables that you collect will have some kind of interrelationships between them, right? Okay, but so that's why, uh, but then trying to work with the joint probability is too complicated because, uh, so first thing is that uh, all these uh, all these uh, ra random variables, yeah, they might be of different types. First thing, right? You might have continuous, you might have categorical, right? Mixed together. So finding this joint probability is uh, a pain, yeah. If you don't have uh, independence, right? So it'll be too complicated. Okay. So uh, that's why uh, in naive base, we basically be sort of like just treat um, the joint probability as a product of individual probabilities, right? This makes it mathematically tractable. It's like, okay, we know that this is uh, probably valid. This is probably not mimicking reality, but uh, at least we have the benefit of mathematical uh, tractability, right? That means you can uh, track ability. That means you can basically uh, compute, right? When you make this uh, assumption, then you can compute, yeah? So basically you can compute it as uh, the following. This one multiply by, this so X1, X2, right? The individual uh, probabilities, right? And multiply to the, Okay, so basically uh, this term here, you can write it as a product of 
the uh, individual conditional probabilities, okay? All right, so this is where the naive comes from, yeah? The naive allows you to write it in a, a product form. If you don't, if you are not naive, you are very realistic, then uh, you will just get stuck with um, the joint form and uh, it's probably too difficult to work with, okay? All right, so, so this illustrates one of the way to think about um, modeling uh, approaches, right? Uh, sometimes when you do modeling, uh, don't, it's good to inject some kind of realism, right, into the model, but um, part of the art of modeling is knowing when to uh, make certain simplifying assumptions so that you have a tractable model, right? Uh, while at the same time, keep enough keeping enough complexity in your data to capture the reality, okay? Uh, this is a kind of an art. So um, you will need, to, if you uh, want to become a good modeler, you have to keep practicing. Then you will develop some intuitions on how to do these things at the right time, okay? Okay, so here this is, gives you a very good, in my opinion, this is a very good example of, um, um, simplifying approach in modeling assumptions that actually leads to a very robust uh, classifier. The naive base is actually very robust. Although it makes this uh, kind of like uh, assumption that is not fulfilled in reality, but um, it turns out to be actually a, quite a robust classifier. Right? It performs well in, in uh, reality. And there are some papers written about this to try to explain it. So if you're interested, there's a very interesting paper called, uh, it's written by an, uh, an expert, right, uh, in machine learning. It's called uh, Naive Base. Uh, not so naive, after all. So where this person is written by uh, DJ Han. DJ Han is a very famous, um, He's a very good writer about uh, machine learning uh, topics, right? And he's a, he, he writes very well, okay? So if you, write, if you want to, you can actually find his articles and read. He always has something interesting to say about um, this kind of machine learning uh, models, right? How to use them properly. Um, and he also tries to explain how he also tries to explain uh, how certain models actually work. Uh, try to understand the, the uh, sometimes the surprising performance of certain simple models, okay? All right, okay, so, so, so we got this part settled, right? So, um, so the naive part simply means uh, that you can actually decompose it like this, okay? Write it as a product, right? Now, uh, okay, let me clear the clutter a little bit. So, uh, actually the the Bayesian uh, theorem is a very powerful method in, in uh, statistics, right? Uh, it's one of the things that I would recommend you to, if, if you want to spend time to learn some particular topics, uh, this is a very worthwhile topic to, uh, Bayesian statistics, uh, very worthwhile to study. Okay, it, it has a, a lot of very uh, powerful applications to real, uh, data, okay? Bayes theorem. Don't get, don't get scared by this, this, all this formula. This basically, um, there's already a very mature framework for implementing a Bayesian analysis, right? So as long as you get the concept, you can do the uh, main model, then, then a lot of the computations actually you can do with software, okay? Um, all right, okay. 
So then uh, let's go to, let's continue. Um, then essentially, if you apply Bayer's model here, what you get is the following. So basically you want to ask, uh, now of course this is if, if you, you see, if you know the class, right? Now what happens is that uh, when in a prediction setting, right? You, you don't see the class, you see the data, right? You see data. And you want to ask what is the chance that it falls, it is actually the, the class label is plus one or minus one, okay? You see data and you want to predict uh, the class label, okay? So this is uh, what you want, right? But this is what you know, okay? This is what I want, what we want, and this is what we know. So how do we connect these two quantities, right? So we connect them using Bayer's theorem, okay? So here, connecting it will be simple. So it's a reverse conditioning. By the way, this is a vector. So basically, it's actually a, it's actually a large x, right? It's actually a, it's a vector, right? So, all right, so this one is, uh, so multiply by P of uh, Y equals to plus one over P of uh, X, okay. Um, by the way, just to let you know, um, this formulation right, of Bayer's theorem is actually, um, it, it's not a mystery, right? Because uh, basically this is uh, just, a kind of rearrangement like this. So your P condition on B is basically uh, A intersect B over PB by definition, right? Okay. So, um, and then of course you can, uh, the intersection doesn't matter, right? Whichever one you do first. So then you can introduce, um, okay. So you can, this is a, you, you introduce a multiplication by one trick, right? Okay, PA over PA, right? So multiplication by one trick and then you rearrange, okay? So basically then after that you apply the uh, definition. So this will give you your reverse conditioning. Okay. And uh, so this part here is this part, all right? Okay, it's not a mystery. Basically this, uh, once you know, um, the definition of conditional probability, then this is basically Bayes' theorem is just a consequence of rearranging um, uh, some terms inside that, right? And then uh, introducing the multiplication by one, okay? So it's not a, it's not a very deep kind of uh, result, right? Simple enough, okay? So, so basically you have, okay, let's go back here. So basically now you have uh, this reverse conditioning. So by applying Bayer's theorem, you can get, uh, so this is what we call a posterior probability. The posterior probability for plus one, okay? Y equals to plus one. This one is what we call a prior probability of plus one. The posterior means, uh, posterior probability means after looking at data, after given data, okay? After given data, you try to find the probability of the class. So that's called a posterior probability, right? Posterior is after given data. The prior probability means not given data, right? So without data, what is, well, without giving, giving you any data, what can you say about the probability of y equals to plus one? Okay, so basically it's just an opinion, right? So what is your opinion about uh, y being plus one, right? Is it point one? is it point two? and so on, right? So basically this part here uh, becomes a kind of a parameter, right? A parameter for, for your ND model, right? Your naive phase model, right? The naive base model, you can set things to be like equal prior. Equal prior meaning that uh, plus one and minus one have the same probability, right? Um, then or otherwise you could actually set it to be, uh, your prior can be like maybe 0.99 or 
all right? For example, if, if you are working with some kind of problems where the class of interest is very rare, okay? So you're, you might want to actually adjust the prior, yeah? Not, don't use the equal prior, but adjust it to reflect uh, what is known in general, yeah? About um, their natural uh, prior probabilities, okay? Like for example, if you do credit card fraud, right? Okay, if you're going to use naive base to do credit card fraud, your prior probability that the card is a fraud, yeah? Uh, needs to be set to some very low value, okay? Because uh, otherwise you, your model prediction will, will be uh, making a, quite a lot of mistakes. Okay, because uh, simply because your prior, your prior there is not actually reflecting uh, the, the actual uh, distribution uh, correctly. Okay, it doesn't have to uh, uh, reflect it exactly correct, but uh, in some kind of neighborhood, right? As long as it's close enough, uh, it should be okay. All right, so, um, so okay, so that's the prior, okay? So is that okay? So this is the posterior probability for plus one. And similarly, we can do the posterior probability for minus one, right? The other class, right? Um, so basically this is just, um, okay, minus one times this. Okay, y equals to minus one, P of x, okay? Right, so basically we, we also have the same form except that uh, this is different, yeah? The class uh, is a different class, right? Okay? Now, so once we come to this part, okay. So let me write down, so we have the posterior probability for plus one. And then we have the posterior probability for minus one. This allows us to compute the, so, so one of the um, annoying thing in uh, Bayer's uh, probability is the, uh, the likelihood of the data. This thing here. So you have, Sorry, um, so this one is X. Um, okay, and you have P of Y equals to plus one over the likelihood, okay? So this part here, we call this the likelihood of data. So because uh, basically this is actually not uh, important, all right? It's just some kind of a constant that is uh, specific to um, your pa a particular problem, right? So we can actually remove this, uh, this uh, constant here by taking the, uh, uh, the following, uh, the posterior, we consider the posterior odds for y equals to plus one, which basically is uh, taking the ratio here, yeah? Minus one, okay? So then uh, that will allow you to get rid of the uh, likelihood term. All right, so this, these two are easy to set, right? These two are easy to set, okay? Because over here, this is very simple. This is basically just, uh, uh, if I use a not notation, this is a plus pi plus over one minus pi plus, okay? Just uh, y equals to minus one, the prior, so it's equal to what the complement yeah, of uh, p y equals to plus one. Okay, so this part is easy to to do. It's just basically your it's basically your assumption, right? 
Okay, and it's a model parameter. Okay. So you have uh, the, this is your posterior odds. Right. Okay, so um, the posterior odds, so this is a PO. The posterior odds can be, uh, you can basically, so, so after you computed this, you have some value, right? So your posterior odds is equal to, um, thing okay so your this implies that your pro posterior probability yeah is equal to posterior odds times uh, this posterior probability and this is equal to one minus p of y equals to plus one condition of x right because given the data, your class is either minus one or plus one, right? So you can apply the complementation here. And, and working out, so you will have uh, the posterior probability will be equal to the posterior uh, odds over one plus the posterior of posterior odds, okay? And the posterior probability here will be equal to one over one plus the posterior odds. Okay, so, so the posterior odds will allow you to get rid of the, the likelihood term here. And then if you want to work with the probabilities, right, the posterior probabilities, you can uh, recover the, the posterior probabilities uh, from uh, the posterior odds, okay? All right, so, so this is a very uh, uh, kind of like a nice way to basically remove this term, right? We don't want this term. This term is basically, it's, it may be complicated to evaluate, okay? So with this method, we basically uh, remove this obstacle in calculating uh, this uh, unnecessary term, okay? So this is, uh, I explained this because uh, in, in Naive based models, you can actually get um, the report, right? Later you will see. Uh, so the output of the model is uh, the posterior probabilities, okay? So I just want to link you up to how that is actually obtained from the posterior odds. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? about uh, up to this point, yeah, the technical parts. So the model is very simple, yeah, it's just, it's just relying on the, uh, these things here. Okay, um, right, okay. So now, just to let you see how, what actually happens in, in uh, so, so now is the naive phase in action. In action. Okay. Um, let me construct a setting. Uh, so this is a data set. Um, so let's say uh, in this data set, I have uh, three variables, yeah? So these are your sample one, two, three, until maybe 100. So over here, I also have, let's say I also have 100, okay? 
and over here this the class label here is plus one this one the class label here they are all minus one okay so then you have a variable one which is a categorical variable and variable two uh, also a categorical variable and the variable three is actually a uh, numeric variable okay so this categorical variable here is uh, maybe perhaps uh, you have two levels female and male all right this one is maybe some kind of uh, medical condition okay variable two maybe you have three levels uh, mild moderate or severe okay three levels and this one is basically some kind of a numeric uh, continuous value. Maybe it's some kind of um, blood measurement or whatever, okay? This is some continuous, something that you can measure, okay? Now, if we're going to use the uh, uh, naive base here, so uh, one, question here may be that uh, okay so it's fine enough with categorical variables right because we can compute the uh, conditional probabilities from the contingency table yeah but how about the continuous variables so continuous variables here there are actually two implementations and um, one implementation is that you you basically what you do is you you basically discretize you basically discretize the uh, continuous variable, okay? Um, that means you create bins, right? You create bins for your uh, for the for the for certain intervals. Then you will put them in certain categories, right? You create bins for that, okay? You can discret discretize. For example, if you have a distribution like this. So you can actually create uh, four bins, like one bin is here, one bin is here, one bin is here, then one bin is, so this is the other bin, the rest, okay? The rest. So, so any values here will fall in this bin, any values here will fall in this bin, any values will fall in this bin and so on, okay? Um, how many bins to create? Well, that will be up to you, right? So, so generally you create reasonable number of bins. So you can basically discretize the categorical variable. This is one way. The other way um, is to assume some kind of a model. Assume a Gaussian model. Um, for your variable three, right? And then you will basically use the density as the uh, probability. Okay, so the the uh, probability is replaced by the density function. Okay, so you will have f x equals to one over square root of two pi uh, sigma square for the plus e of minus uh, x minus mu plus squared over two sigma square plus, okay? So that's the normal density. In, in uh, the naive base uh, uh, function that we're going to see later, right, in R, it uses this approach, yeah? Okay, it uses this approach. Um, if you disagree with this kind of uh, approach, then you will have to uh, do your own discretization. There, there could be reasons to disagree with this way of um, uh, including the information from this variable into the model because uh, one objection may be that your, your distribution may actually be very skewed. It's not, not Gaussian. All right, for example, uh, if it's not Gaussian, then uh, using this form can give you something that is very distorted, all right? So that could introduce uh, what you call modeling errors into your naive base. That's one objection, right? Um, however, if, if, uh, if, you can, if you check the 
distribution and it's approximately normal, then uh, I think no harm. It doesn't have to be exactly normal, right? As long as it's kind of like roughly symmetric, it should be pretty okay, all right? Um, nothing is ever going to follow the model exactly, all right? Uh, as long as I think the deviation from model is not too big, you can still stick to the model, all right? Don't be uh, too ideological with statistical models, yeah? As in real life, right? All these ideologies are just opinions. And um, just, just do something that's reasonable, yeah? It's the same with uh, models, right? Um, don't get caught with, like, you know, the model has to be normal, this and that. Well, if, even if it deviates a bit, it doesn't really matter, all right? So, so then, um, so okay, so that, that's the part about uh, the implementation, right? If you don't like this, you strongly believe that uh, this is going to give you er uh, introduce errors, so then you do your own discretization, right? Okay, so, so we're done with this uh, issue of uh, having continuous variables in the naive base already. So now let's see how we actually uh, compute the uh, probabilities, right? So from here, actually, you can actually have, uh, for example, here, this is female, this is male, this is female, and so on and so forth, right? This one can be male, 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 and so on, female, right? This one may be uh, male, this one may be severe, this one may be severe, and so on, okay? This one may be moderate, moderate, and severe, and so on, all right? And this may be just some values like 1.7, 2.5, 0.8, whatever. This one may be uh, 8.1, 8.2, 6.9, 10.5, whatever, okay? All right, so, so I, I'm sure you are familiar with this kind of data structure, okay? Now, how to proceed, yeah? Okay, so this is what we, um, so this is your training set. Okay, so this is your training set. Which is basically the, the set of data that you use. So remember, you have got uh, your data, right? The entire data. And you allocate one part for training, the other part for test, right? Test data, test set. Okay, so this is actually for your training, huh? right? So you're gonna, you're going to train your naive base model, okay? Now, what happens is that uh, you can, from here, you can actually calculate the following. Uh, for the plus one class, right? The probability that you get a male. So you count all together how many of them, right? So suppose you have um, 70 males, right? So this will be 0 0.7. And of course, uh, for female, that's just a complement, right? So that will be 0 0.3. And you can also do it for, you do it for the other class, male, y equals to plus one. Suppose you get 20 over 100, um, 0 0.2. Uh, I think, so your, your plus one is it, I think at a different place, it's like, I Sorry? Mean, like here and here. Isn't this two is the same? Oh, sorry, sorry. It's, yeah, 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 correct, correct. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks. Thanks for pointing out. So, no, three. this plus one, huh? Okay, this minus one, all right? Okay, thanks for pointing out. This is from group plus one. Okay. So, this one is uh, minus one. So, this would be 0 0.8, okay? So, we are done with the probabilities for variable one. So now we look at the probability for variable two. Okay, so we have a uh, given plus one. So the mile is, uh, let's say 0 0.4, right? Moderate is 
zero point three, and severe is zero point three. Okay, for plus one, and similarly, you will have this one zero point one. Moderate. This is zero point one. Severe, this is, uh, sorry, it's minus one. Okay. Minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay, so this is 0 0.8. So we also got this part covered. All right. And then finally, the third part, if we are going to use, if we use the uh, Gaussian uh, model, then we will have fx even y equals to plus one. There will be one equals to square root of two pi. Um, so suppose uh, for this group, right, you estimated, so you have n is uh, zero, let's say uh, maybe zero, one. And here this one is maybe one, uh, maybe let's say two, one, okay? So this will be uh, times one e of minus x squared over 2 and for minus 1 you will get 1 over square root of 2 pi e minus x minus 2 squared over 2 okay so for continuous uh, variables you work with the density function right uh, instead of your uh, probability okay all right okay is it is it clear all these uh, ingredients yeah for the different variables right for all the both classes are ready now right so now let's look at uh, how to make a calculation okay so let's say suppose your data vector is the following you get a male you get a um, get maybe severe and then you observe 0 0.5 all right so this is the data vector so you want to find the probability that uh, so you want to find the this this probability first yeah uh, even if it is plus one what's the probability of observing this data vector right so this will be equal to p of x1 equals to m okay times x2 equals to severe times x3 equals to uh, well then it's not f x3 uh, it's not probability but a density f of x3 um, so that's basically uh, 0 0.5, right? So you basically have 0 0.5 uh, given y equals to plus one, okay? So therefore, you can calculate this uh, by reading all this from this information. So the first one will be 0 0.7. The second one is 0 0.3, right? This term here, right? First term, second term. The third term will be one over square root two pi e of minus 0.5 squared over two, okay? This one. Okay, so you can calculate this value. And of course, similarly, you can calculate for y equals to minus one, right? And this will be, so you just basically read from the minus one. So you have this one, 0 0.2. Um, then you have this one, 0 0.8. And then you have this one, right? One over square two pi e of minus 0 0.5 minus two squared over two, okay, some value.
All right. Okay. So Okay, so you have these two uh, conditional probabilities. So basically what you want is the, uh, the, the uh, po posterior, posterior odds for plus one, right? So y equals to plus one given data over y equals to minus one or given data, right? So this is the posterior odds. And this is uh, from the previous work just now is x plus 1, x minus 1 times the, posti uh, the prior probabilities for plus 1, okay. Prior probability for minus 1. So if you assume the equal, pri equal priors, yeah, so this will simplify to 1, right, okay. This is equal prior assumption. And therefore, you over here, you basically just need to find out these two values, right? 0 0.7 times 0 0.3 times that thing. Okay, 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 times this, okay. All right. So that will give you the uh, posterior odds, right? So you get your posterior odds computed. And if you want to find the uh, posterior probability, right? If you want to find P of, uh, sorry, uh, Y, equals to plus one given x posterior probability for plus one. This will be uh, from what we did just now is posterior odds over one plus posterior odds, okay? And the other one is just the complement, right? So this is basically just one over one plus the posterior odds. All right, so, the, so this is how the calculation is uh, is done, all right. Uh, so you will, so basically you will end up uh, for the, okay, for the test set, right? So this is of course coming from the test set. So you will have a prediction, right? Okay, you have a prediction. And after you have done everything, then, um, so basically after you have done everything, so this will be your, posterior probability for plus one. And this will be your density. So you can plot a histogram, right? Okay, so you may find that um, some of them may actually have some distribution like this. And the other one may have a distribution that is going like this. Okay, zero. Okay, so of course here you can find the, uh, uh, again, uh, just like your logistic regression, right? you can find a cutoff, you can look at different cutoffs and then, um, and then, uh, then you will have your uh, performance metrics, right? Your sensitivity, your specificity and so on, right? So basically you need to design a cutoff where uh, at certain cutoff, anything that is, uh, if your posterior probability for plus one is on this side, you will predict as plus one, for example, and on the other side, you'll predict as minus one, okay? All right, so that's the idea, yeah? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the general idea. Uh, and of course, there are some minor things like, for example, uh, what if for your training set, uh, what if 
uh, certain levels, right? They have zero problem. You have zero count. For example, just now, right? Um, if one of the variables you have uh, female and male, right? What if you get something like this? Especially if you don't have enough training set, you might end up with like zero and 20. Okay. Um, but then when you have zero, right, uh, you will introduce problem into the model because um, as long as that's, as long as this appears, right, the whole, the whole uh, probability will go to zero, yeah, because of uh, zero multiplication, okay? So you don't want that to happen, right? This is what we call a singularity. Singularity, right? So singularities are bad for the models because they are, they are, they are kind of like pathological, right? Uh, in, in fact, it is actually not zero. This probability is not really zero, but you get zero because, uh, simply because by chance, yeah? Okay? So basically, they, um, in the implementations, they will do some kind of correction called Laplace correction. A Laplace correction is that you add a pseudo count. Okay, to break the zero, to break zero. So basically when you have zero, right, it will basically, instead of uh, giving zero over 20, it will go one over 20. You just add a pseudo count of one. All right, then you will have 0 0.05 instead of zero, right? So this is uh, the way uh, the model actually overcomes problems of uh, zero count, yeah? In general, you will not have this problem uh, if your sample size is large enough, okay, you you will uh, because you, you think about this. If your sample size one thousand, right, you need or you have a sample size hundred or one thousand. All of them, right, okay, are of one particular type, right. That's uh, that's indicative of some kind of very serious bias. So you may either want to not consider that variable or um, in, in that case, I think even adding a pseudo count will not help you because uh, that, that is basically just uh, suggesting maybe um, sometimes may be uh, biased, but sometimes may be true, right? So, so you still have to look at the uh, uh, situation. Like for example, uh, if people drink poison, they certainly die, right? So uh, in that case, uh, you you will not get uh you, you 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 no matter how hard you try you will not get something that is um uh, having kind of like everyone drinking poison die okay so okay so this just to tell you something about uh uh pseudo counts okay in fact the adding of pseudo count is uh in the old days it was considered some kind of a clever hack Right, just to get out of some tight situation. Uh, I think we know this better now. Um, actually, adding a pseudo count is actually a kind of uh, Bayesian estimation. Right? If you have studied some Bayesian statistics, uh, usually adding pseudo counts is like, uh, if, you, if you study, uh, for example, study Bayesian statistics, you will know that um, when especially when you have a binomial model, right? Okay, and binomial model and you put a beta prior on your success probability, right? Then uh, basically the estimator for your uh, success probability is uh, the, uh, it, will, it, it, it will actually be of some kind of form like this, right? X over N, something like this, right? Where, where this, Alpha and beta are the parameters of your beta distribution with alpha beta, right? So basically, you, this is like a pseudo counts, okay? For example, if your x is equal to zero, right? People add some value here. Let's say they add one or add one half or whatever, right? So if you use a kind of what we call a Jeffries prior, Jeffries prior is uh, alpha equals to beta equals to one over two. So they will, instead of estimating it as, estimating p hat as uh, x over n, they will estimate as x, uh, x 
x plus 1 over 2 over n plus 1. Okay, so this is like uh, adding, this is the same as adding pseudo counts. Okay, so now we know that uh, pseudo counts are actually kind of like equivalent to Bayer's estimation, which is nice because uh, it gives it a good uh, theoretical uh, base. Okay, so this is uh, how you actually, uh, what actually happens with the mechanics of naive base for general kind of, uh, general kind of uh, problem like this. Um, the other type of uh, problem is uh, maybe that's more, maybe more specialized is uh, document analysis. Okay, document analysis. Um, so, so it's actually a big topic, uh, very interesting topic. So basically you have some kind of documents, right? Written in words. Okay. Um, you can actually filter out, uh, you remove the uh, prepositions, articles, And those kind of uh, maybe maybe uh, some I don't know like those those kind of uh, words that actually are just for grammar purpose, right? After you so so after that you will have a vocabulary. Okay, you have some vocabulary, right? So you imagine this. Um, so the example that I'm going to talk about is the spam filter. Okay, so the spam filter basically is a computer program that helps you automatically uh, throw incoming mails, emails that are rubbish, right? That contain uh, uh, basically like uh, unsolicited material about all kinds of things, right? That, that basically is annoying. So you don't even need to see it because your, your uh, email service provider, they they will activate it and they will just throw it into the uh, dustbin, right? You don't even see them, okay? But they can make mistakes, right? Sometimes some important mails that you are waiting for, you don't see them, but uh, you don't see them, uh, and then, but then the other side said they already sent, right? So it's probably in your junk mail, uh, spam mail, because uh, your spam program just decided that it was a spam and threw it into the bin, okay? Right, okay, let's see how, how the spam filter actually works using the naive base, right? They, they love using naive base for spam filters. Um, okay, so what happens is the following. So you can collect, uh, uh, so these are like many documents, right? maybe like this can be like million, right? So these are spam. So, Maybe you also have one million. These are okay, uh, normal meal. Okay. So, so obviously there will be many, many such documents, right? So uh, you have this email, you have this email. Some emails are long, some emails are short and so on and so forth, right? So many, many. So these are all the spam and the others are the normal meal. Okay. Okay. So after that, uh, from here, you can build the vocabularies, right? You build the vocabulary from here, and then you can take the union of the vocabularies. Okay. So basically, you take the union of all the vocabulary, uh, I equals to one, until like uh, everything. So then you will have your word number one, word number two, word number three, and so on. Maybe I just put a few uh, for context. So, um, something like health, science, uh, free, 
money, casino, play, whatever. Okay, some words. All right. So then for, then you can see here, right? For spam one, right? So you check through all these words. So each word is actually a, is actually a variable. Okay. And then you count how many times the word appears in the spam, right? Health maybe didn't come out, size maybe didn't, three maybe came out three times, money maybe once, casino maybe once, play maybe five, and so on, okay? So all together then you have, okay? So then uh, the other ones you can have maybe, so on, and so on and so forth, right? The normal one may be something like this. So on. Okay. Right. So uh, then what happens is that you can actually, you can actually uh, then sum, right? You, you, you have a total sum. sum. So suppose uh, this occurred maybe 500. So this occurred maybe 100 times. This occurred maybe, uh, 50 times, this occurred maybe um, 100,000 times, and this maybe occurred 1 million times, this maybe occurred 1,000 times, and this maybe occurred, okay? And here, this may be um, 1,000 times, this may be 100 times, this may be, uh, 1,000 times and so on, okay? It's just some sum, right? Okay? So then of course you have your total, right? You have your total. Total for spam. So total for not spam. So then you can construct uh, probabilities, right? So, so basically here you, you have a probability, right? So let's say you have theta. have theta equals to, um, so this theta hat, right, for the spam. So it will be all these uh, probabilities, like maybe this is 0 0.005, uh, 0 this may be 0 0.0001, this may be uh, 0 0.1, that may be zero point, so uh, maybe three, zero point zero five, and so on. Yeah. So the thing is, they they sum to one, right? Okay. So here you also have a uh, probability vector for normal. So this may be uh, zero point two. It's too high, maybe 0 0.02, 0 0.005, 0 0.02, and maybe and so on. Okay, this will also sum to one. Okay, so this actually is uh, what we called this as a multinomial model. Okay, it, it is a, basically a generalization of your binomial, right? Generalization of binomial because uh, binomial only has two outcomes whereas this so you, you are basically treating all these uh, variables as outcomes okay so you have basically have a multinomial model okay yeah okay Now, once you have this multinomial model, then uh, you can deploy your uh, 
uh, naive base, right? So your naive base is the following. So, uh, so we calculate these things. So over here, this is your word vector, right? Word uh, frequency, sorry, vector or word frequency. Okay, so you know the multinomial model, right? Is the following. Okay, QXP um, is given by n factorial over x1 factorial until xp factorial. Then eta1, eta2, and until theta p, right? So this is xp. And you sum xi from 1 to p is equal to 1. Uh, sorry, um, equal to n. And the uh, sum of the theta must be equal to 1, right? Okay, so this is your multinomial model. Okay, so, so then you want to calculate this thing, right? Um, therefore, this will be equal to, now this term here basically is not going to be, we, we don't bother with this term because later, so we basically will just call this as C. Because later, um, because this is basically just from the data, right? So for the other uh, class, this will also be the same. So when you take the posterior posterior probability, it will cancel off, yeah? So this, this is actually your, uh, the nuisance part, right? You don't need to care about this part. You only care about the part where you, uh, you use the estimated uh, probabilities from the training set. So basically now you basically have theta one hat from the theta two hat. So these are all from the uh, training, from the training set. Okay, already estimated from the training set. So then basically this will be your x1, x2, until xp. So these are the counts from your test sample, yeah? Test sample with uh, this vector, right? Okay. All right. So then of course you can similarly calculate This term, this will still be C. Um, this one is uh, and this one is from um, okay. Uh, again, it's x one, x two, and x p. So, so your theta star is this one is from uh, minus one. Okay. So then uh, things are simple here. So you have posterior probability will be uh, posterior prob probability for the uh, plus one, minus one. So this will be uh, C of this. This one will be this, okay? So you take, uh, so of course there's the, uh, let me see over here. Yeah, of course you, you, you will have your, uh, prior, right? So this is your prior. And uh, P of X, right? P of X. Okay. 
So you divide, you take the posterior odds, and this will cancel, yeah? These two things will cancel. This thing will cancel. So you are left with uh, some very nice result here, which is uh, theta 1 over theta 1 star. X1 multiply theta P over this a hat, yeah? xp and multiply by the um, priors okay all right so once you have got the posterior odds so this is your posterior odds and depending on the assumption uh, you can you can uh, okay so so depending on your assumption about the priors yeah so it will change okay so this probably this posterior odds will change yeah Right, but then uh, these are all easily uh, done, right? Because they have been estimated from the training set, right? So these are from your test samples, okay? So you can therefore assign uh, a posterior probability for uh, class plus one, class minus one to your test samples. All right? And then after that, you can use the same method, right? You can uh, find the cutoff, for which uh, you get the best performance, right, for your classification. Okay, so this is for word frequency, um, for dealing with uh, document analysis using a uh, naive, uh, naive base. All right, okay, so uh, are there any questions about the naive base up to this point? Not at the moment. Is it is it clear enough for everyone? It seems okay to me, uh, Yeah. Uh, how about others? Yeah, okay, yeah. I think it's not uh it's not very hard. You know, the the theory is actually very nice. The computations also quite uh simple. Uh, I mean like of course there are many terms, but then uh once you code it up in the computer it is uh not a big deal, all right. Okay. So now I would like you to uh we, we just look at the demo, right? So we'll be curious as to how the decision boundary for uh, when you use naive base, right, on the same data set, right, the, the Wisconsin breast cancer data set, uh, also the same two dimensions like what we did for uh, last week for support vector machine. We're curious how, how its uh, decision boundary will actually look like because uh, remember this method itself does not explicitly Actually, actually you, you don't really know. You cannot see the decision boundary uh, for this method because it's an abstract method, right? Uh, you're basically just calculating the uh, probabilities and then you use a cutoff. Right? So, but then we'll be curious, right? We, uh, how, how would it look like, okay? So for this, uh, let's go to the uh, demo. Can you see my uh, R console? Yes. yes. Okay. So let me just open. Okay, just a minute. It's uh.
MacBook is suddenly hanging. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to quit quit this thing and start it again. Okay, can you see my R console now? Yes. Okay, all right. So let's open the file. Okay, so, okay, for this example, um, uh, the naive base, uh, there are actually quite a few R packages for implementing naive base, right? Um, so the, in the E1071 R package, which uh, we used last week to do decision, uh, sorry, to do SVM, it also has um, a function to do naive base, all right? So basically, uh, we just load this, yeah? So we read and then process. Now, um, it's important to to sometimes, uh, you know, this this uh, your class label should be a factor. Yeah? So if it's not a factor variable, you have to coerce it into a factor variable. Otherwise, uh, what the sometimes students they get very frustrated, like they are running the code like like similar kind of codes, right? But they still they keep getting errors. The reason is because uh, sometimes um, your response variable, right, your class label, is actually a character variable, right? In the in the uh, once you read it from the CSV, somehow it is a character variable. So um, a lot of these methods, right, it assumes that the class label is a factor variable, right? So that's where the error actually comes out the message. But it usually is not very informative, right? The error so. So you get frustrated, like you don't know what's going on, right? So the way to do it is, uh, the safe way is to check, to, to force it to become a factor, right? So over here, you'll see that I have a one line of uh, processing code here, I say as factor, right? So that takes care of any uh, future problems. You will notice that if you don't do this, yeah, you, don't, you don't try to make it a factor, and you try to run the naive base, you will get errors, okay? So anyway, uh, so you do everything properly. So then uh, it's very simple. They call the function naive base, uh, give the uh, class label, and then uh, here I'm using um, um, these two variables, right? Because I want to plot, I want to plot the decision boundary in two dimensional space, right? In practice, uh, of course, we don't need to plot it, right? This is just out of uh, curiosity to see the geometry. So then, uh, okay, then we want to do the, the plot the decision boundary, right? So here, this one, we recycle the code from last week. Um, paste. Okay, so I think, uh, I don't know, like the last week, I think the code that's inside this plot boundary uh, file, I think I didn't, I didn't just kind of like do it. I just put function or whatever, right? So uh, you should actually, uh, if you, I mean like by now, I think you are familiar enough, right? So you should be able to fill in this part on your own. Uh, so you basically need to define this uh, plot boundary function for this case, yeah? Uh, if you want to use it for other cases, uh, you need to adjust this a little bit, okay? Um, so after you have, that you can uh, look at the plot the boundary. Let's hope this works. All 
right? Okay, it's running. So then have a new share. Okay. All right. So can you see the figure? Yes. Okay. So this is the decision boundary for naive base. Interesting, right? It looks like a circular. Um, it looks like a circular uh, boundary. Well, of course, in this case, uh, I'm basically just uh, predicting. Uh, okay, so. Of course, here uh, I am actually not uh, doing the very serious kind of um, uh, prediction in the sense that I have a test sample that I didn't use for training, right? Is this just to uh, for kind of like theoretical understanding, right? So in, in real practice, of course, we need to separate, but that would maybe create a few more steps, right? So I, I wanted to just focus on the, the understanding, okay? So here, uh, of course, I'm using all the training set to to build the model, right? So these predicted values are all the values that are taken from these grids, okay? As you can see, uh, any value that's in the blue region, they will be predicted as uh, blue, right? The red region will be predicted as red, right? So this is very uh, nice, right? I think this, this decision boundary is, is pretty, pretty interesting. At least it did, it did better than the polynomial. Uh, you remember the uh, polynomial kernel for SVM, right? So we got some circular, uh, some elliptic boundary like that. But this one is kind of like a circle. Totally, uh, you, you really cannot anticipate this boundary just from um, looking at the method. Okay, so then we, let's go back to... console. So then I want to show, uh, okay, so you can learn how to use the predict predict uh, function uh, in R. It's very powerful, yeah? So once you've got the model estimated, um, then this part here, the so usually the predict function works like this. You have an estimated model, and then over this part here, you basically put the data that you want to be used for prediction, right? And generally, uh, if you do serious kind of uh, machine learning work, then this, will, this entry here is actually the test samples, right? But of course, over here, I'm just using the training set uh, for illustration, okay? Then type equals to raw will give you the posterior probabilities. So you can look at um, edge of the RED. Okay, so these are your posterior probabilities for B9 and malignant case, all right? You can, of course, uh, ask it to give you the other type. Uh, so this will be uh, class, okay? So here it will basically give you a B9 or malignant. It just gives you the label. Now, actually, there's a bit of a things that are hidden here. Um, you know that uh, we, we actually need to have a cutoff, right? To In order to decide uh, whether you want to predict as one class or the other. So over here is actually when you ask it to predict, it's actually not clear what is it doing. Uh, type equals to class, so then it gives you like uh, malignant, benign. So what is the cutoff that's used, right? Um, it's unclear from here, but I suspect it's actually they use a 0 0.5, right? They just set. Um, I'm not sure whether this predict function with the class, they actually uh, you know, go through all the possible cutoffs and then give you the best one. Not sure. You can maybe um, try it out yourself, all right, if you want to investigate. But from here, I believe it is just using 0 0.5, right? Uh, why do I say so? Uh, let's look at this, yeah? So I can look at the uh, table. Okay, um, I do reset this as raw. Okay. All right.
right? So this one is uh, I'm basically tabling it, tabling the result, right? The second column is a posterior probability for malignant. So I get this table, yeah. This this uh, classification matrix. So my cutoff is zero point five, right? Um, if I look at the class here. I can actually table this as well. Um, so I table, in this case, I will table just PRET with the diagnosis, okay? All right, so I basically get the same table. So that's why I kind of like suspect that it is um, implicitly using just a 0.5 as the cutoff. Okay, so anyway, um, just to look at some visualization results, okay? So we can do the histogram to look at the distribution of the probabilities, yeah? So, oops, default. Uh, okay, okay, so I need to change the prediction back. So this one I have to use the raw and uh, so then I share the figure. Okay. So can you see the histogram? Yes. Okay. So now you see the, well, in this case, the prediction just now you saw the table, right? It is very, the result is pretty good, right? Most of the, the, Predicted values are falling on the diagonal, okay, which indicates that you're, you are classifying them correctly. So it's actually coming from here. You look at the distribution of the blue and red, right? So the red one is the malignant, the blue one is the benign, right? So very obviously, since your the distribution of your probabilities is so skewed, right? One is going to one side, the other going to the other side. So no, no wonder uh, your prediction results are pretty good. So basically, if you set a cutoff like over here, then uh, anything towards uh, less than 0 0.5, you predict as the blue uh, benign, and more than 0 0.5, predict as malignant. Right? So of course, you're going to make a, a bit of mistakes here, a bit of mistakes here, right? Uh, okay, but this is, remember, this is only working with two variables, yeah? You already get pretty good results like this. So imagine if you have more, if you use more of the, variables, okay? All right, okay. So, all right, so that, that's all the demonstration I want to do, uh, what I want to show you using uh, Naive Bayes. Yeah. You can uh, feel free to play around with it. Okay, so, uh, okay, so it's already 7.30 something, so, Okay, so let's uh, take a break now. So we come back at um, 8.15, right? Okay.